Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda, and this is the channel where we lean into and look at some in-depth analysis of the question of the Old Testament canon, and specifically those books that Catholics and Orthodox call the Deuterocanon, which Protestants call Apocrypha. And our last video, last time I was together with you, we looked at this idea of the defilement of hands in rabbinic literature, and we tried to answer the question, how is it that sacred text could cause the defilement of the hands? And I think we gave uh, what I believe is probably the best theory out there as to why defilement language is applied to the handling of sacred text. Well, today we're going to look specifically not at the Deuterocanon, but at what I would call some fringe books of the Hebrew canon, or I should say the rabbinic canon, and discussions over the sacredness of those books. So it'll be very interesting and very, very important pieces of evidence in regards to the formation, the scriptures in rabbinic Judaism. So uh, by the way, if you haven't done it and you're enjoying these videos, I highly recommend please subscribe, like, ring the bell, and by the way, if you'd like to support me or uh, and or William Albrecht, we're both on Patreon and we're thankful for any support you could give us because that enables us to get fresh resources and make videos such as this. So buckle up your seatbelts because the Apocrypha Apocalypse is about to begin. Now, something that I have been resounding over and over again since I first wrote my book, Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger, way back when, is this idea of canon. The word canon, and in some ways the concept of a canon, comes quite late, and it's a Christian term. And so I always frown upon and try to discourage people from using terms and ideas like the canon in early literature where it doesn't belong, and that especially doesn't belong in rabbinic literature. There's no discussion over the canon, okay? Rather, the Jews spoke of the inspiration and sacredness of the books, and that really is where we ought to be focusing whenever we're talking about the OT canon, is the question of inspiration. Because if a book is inspired, then it's sacred, and therefore, it belongs in the Bible. It belongs in the canon. However, if it's not sacred, it's just a mere human writing, then obviously it's not sacred. It's profane, just like any other human writing, and it would not be considered canonical today. So what's interesting is the rabbis held to that concept. They only spoke of the uh, sacred scriptures in terms of either inspiration or their sacredness. And he did it in a roundabout way. They used terminology about defilement. And in the last video, we talked about how it is that something that's sacred and holy, like sacred scripture, could be said to defile the hands. That's usually something that occurs when you have contact with the, something unclean. But obviously, the holy scriptures are unclean. And we talked about that, how the sacredness and the inspirations of scripture appears to have, uh, in biblical thought, been a kind of contagion, just like defilement, that if you have contact with something that's holy, you can actually transmit holiness to other things that you touch. And so to kind of stop that transmission of holiness, uh, it required some sort of ritual washing, which apparently was done with priestly garbs after they uh, offered sacrifices so that they wouldn't transmit holiness outside the temple. Well, this eventually, in rabbinic thought, this idea of uh, holiness was paired with defilement because both of them required some sort of prohi prohibition against contact. So in rabbinic literature, there is an equation between inspired holy scripture and the defilement of the hands. And we pointed that out last time, and it's quite explicitly stated in the Mishnah, Yadim 3.5, says, quote, all holy scripture defiles the hands. Can't get any more clear than that. So what I want to do in this episode 
is look at disputes as to whether certain texts defile the hands. And that essentially boils down to disputes over the inspiration of these texts. And this has very important implications in terms of the closing of the sacred scriptures for rabbinic Judaism. Now, one thing that I've done to these texts is whenever possible, I try to look up the approximate dates when this particular rabbi is said to have lived or taught. The accuracy of these dates, I'm sure, are more approximations than anything. And I also want to note something that Jewish scholarship as well as uh, Christian scholarship have noted, that many times in Jewish literature, we don't have pure history. So we have to take this evidence with the dates with a grain of salt. However, I don't think we need a lot of exactitude in terms of dating, because if anything, all we're looking at is how does rabbinic literature present the issue of the inspiration of certain texts to the rabbis? And so in that regard, these disputes, we can find out when they happened and particularly which books apparently were under dispute. Now, the earliest use of the filing the hands, according to Lee McDonald, who rests on the authority of uh, Lewis when he debunked the Council of Jamnia, Lewis believed that the first person known to use these words, the filing the hands, as a designation for sacred scriptural books is Rabbi Johanan ben Zaki, who flourished around AD 40 or 60. He also is the one who escaped from Jerusalem during a siege in 70 CE and with the permission of the Romans established an academy and the Jewish Sanhedrin at Jamnia or Yabna. Many of you might be familiar with a now debunked idea of the so-called Council of Jamnia. There wasn't a Christian council that voted a scriptural canon. Obviously, they didn't have used the word canon. But there wasn't a council. What was it was an ongoing school, an ongoing legislative body. And part of that legislation and school had to do with which books were sacred and which ones weren't. So let's look at this earliest, the earliest reference, according to Lewis and MacDonald. Quote, the Sadducees say, we have a quarrel to pick with you, O Pharisees, for according to you, the Holy Scriptures defile the hands whereas the writings of Homer do not defile the hands. Rabbi Johanan ben Zaki replied, We have not against the Pharisees, save this. According to them, the bones of an ass are clean, while the bones of Johanan the high priest are unclean. They answered him, Their uncleanness corresponds to their preciousness so that no man would make spoons out of the bones of his father and mother. He said to them, so too the Holy Scriptures. Their uncleanness corresponds to their preciousness. The writings of Homer, which are not precious, do not defile the hands, unquote. So this is from Mishnah, Yadayim 4, 6. It's the translation given in Lyman's uh, canonization. So although it doesn't talk about specific books, it does address this idea of the correspondence of defiling the hands to sacred scripture. And it's very interesting that the Sadducees point that uh, Homer as a, a counterpoint to sacred scripture, that sacred scripture defiles the hands, but the writings of Homer do not. And you have to remember that Homer was considered a sacred text by the Greeks, uh, the pagan Greeks, not the Jewish Greeks. And so this uh, question really is between the sacred and the profane, the inspired and uninspired, although none of those concepts are right there in the text. But it's easy to see how that is lurking in the background. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's continue reading in Mishnah Yadayim. Uh, we'll start with 3.5 and we'll continue. It says, quote, a scroll which was erased in which remained 85 letters, such as the paragraph, and it came to pass when the ark set forth, Numbers 1035, imparts uncleanness to the hands. A scroll in which 85 letters are written, such as the paragraph, and it came to pass when the ark was set forward, imparts uncleanness to the hands. So basically, it's staking out the territory about how much of a sacred text uh, 
remains on the scroll in order for it to be considered uh, something that would defile the hands. Okay, so um, very interesting. Doesn't really say anything about the issue of uh, which books belong in scripture or their inspiration. However, when we carry on, we find in line G of Noisner's translation, quote, all the sacred scriptures impart uncleanness to the hands. Okay, so that's what we read earlier. The Song of Songs and Kuleth, that is Ecclesiastes, imparts uncleanness to the hands. So both these books are inspired and sacred. Judah says, Rabbi Judah says, the Song of Songs imparts uncleanness to the hands, but as to Kuleth, that is Ecclesiastes, there is a dispute. Rabbi Yose, who lived in the second Christian century, says, Kuleth does not impart uncleanness to the hands, that is, Kuleth is not inspired, or Ecclesiastes is not inspired, but as to Song of Songs, there is dispute. Rabbi Simeon said, quote, Kuleth is among the lenient rulings of the house of Shammai and the strict rulings of the house of Hallel. Said Rabbi Simon ben Azai, Azai in the early second Christian century, I have a tradition from the testimony of the 72 elders, quote, on the day on which they seated Rabbi Eleazar ben Azara, who lived in the late first, early second centuries in the session, quote, that the Song of Songs and Kulet do not impart uncleanness to the hands. That is, that this early session in the late first, early second century, uh, this rabbi said that both Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes is not sacred, is not inspired. Said Rabbi Akiva, God forbid, no Israelite man ever disputed concerning Song of Songs, that it imparts uncleanness to the hands. For the entire age is not so worthy as the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the scriptures are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holiest of all. If they disputed, they disputed only concerning Kolath. And said Rabbi Johanan ben Joshua, the son of Rabbi Akiba's father-in-law, according to the words of ben Azai, who was in the early second century, indeed they dispute, and indeed they come to a decision, unquote. So we see here some clear denials of the inspiration of Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, and clear affirmations of their inspiration and sacredness. Uh, what's really interesting in this passage is Rabbi Akiva, who died uh, shortly after the Bar Kokhba revolt in AD 135, he says, God forbid, no Israelite man ever disputed concerning Song of Songs that it imparts on cleanness in the hands. Well, what we'll see is actually that's very hyper, hyperbolic because uh, even within this text, we see people disputing the inspiration of Song of Songs. We won't see a lot of others as well. And he says that for the entire age, is not worthy. So as the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel, and he likens it to the holiest of all the scriptures. Now, many scholars have pointed out that this hyperbole on the part of Akiba must have been motivated by something. His hyperbole is towards the inspiration of Song of Songs. Scholars believe lends credibility to the fact that yeah, Song of Songs inspiration was disputed, and its inspiration was outright denied by some, and therefore Akiba has to overemphasize the inspiration of this book, or the holiness of this book, I should say. But notice he, in doing so, he even throws under the bus, so to speak, Ecclesiastes. He says there was only a dispute over Ecclesiastes. Now, I have to apologize. I inserted the idea of inspiration here. Actually, there is no mention of inspiration in this particular passage. As MacDonald notes, the rabbinic sages regularly employ the words to file the hands in the second century CE, so this second Christian century, on, as a designation for their sacred scriptures. So in Mishnah Yadim 3, uh, 2 through 5, which we read, 
The author uses these words to describe the holiness of the text and inform its readers about the debates over whether Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes were inspired scripture, unquote. And that's precisely what we saw. Now, moving on to Tosepta Yarim, to, uh, that will do 12 and through 14. Have another very interesting discussion that more or less lays over the discussion we just saw. The thongs and the straps which one sews into a scroll, even though it is not permitted to keep them, impart uncleanness to the hands. The container of a scroll and the box of a scroll and the wrappings of a scroll, when they are clean, impart uncleanness to the hands. The segments used for blessings, even though they contain the letters of the divine name and many passages which occur in the Torah, do not impart uncleanness to the hands. So here it's again talking about the um, uh, regulations as to whether something is considered sacred, requires ritual washing. Uh, so something that comes in contact with a sacred document itself uh, is considered to be uh, defiling the hands. And also interesting enough that uh, blessings, even though they might have portions of scripture and even the divine name, it still doesn't impart uh, uncleanness to the hands. All very interesting. And then things continue moving on in 2.13, where we start talking about specific books. The gospels and the books of the heretics do not impart uncleanness to the hands and the book of Ben Sirah and all the books written thenceforward do not impart uncleanness to the hands. Rabbi Simon Ben Manasseh says, quote, the Song of Songs imparts uncleanness to the hands because it is said by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just stop right there. That's very interesting. So here we have a clear connection between inspiration and the defilement of the hands. Uh, Rabbi continues, Kuleth does not impart uncleanness to the hands because it is merely the wisdom of Solomon. So this rabbi does not believe Ecclesiastes is sacred scripture. It's not written by the Holy Spirit. Instead, it is merely just the human wisdom of Solomon. They said to him, and did he write only this alone? Though it says, and Solomon uttered 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005, according to 1 Kings 5.12. And it said, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar, Proverbs 36. And actually, we'll see a little bit clearer discussion of what's going on here in our next text. But nevertheless, I think the most important thing to walk away from with this particular tosepta is this link between inspiration, sacredness, and uncleanness. So it's very clear that this rabbi believed that uh, Song of Songs was inspired, said by the Holy Spirit, therefore it defiles the hands. Ecclesiastes, however, apparently was not written by the Holy Spirit, according to the rabbi, it was just merely the wisdom of Solomon, and therefore it did not impart uncleanness to the hands. Now, let's just really quick, we'll move to the Babylonian Talmud, which picks up on these discussions. And so there's going to be some overlap here. But nevertheless, I think it, it's very helpful, especially about that last part in the Tosepto that we read. And by the way, again, I put the dates in so you can kind of get a feel for approximately when these discussions and disputes happen, um, at least according to the documents. Said Rob Judah, said Samuel, the scroll of Esther does not defile the hands, meaning that Samuel thinks that Esther was not said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But said Samuel, Esther was said through the Holy, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It was said to read, but it was not said to write. They retorted, Rabbi Meyer said, Ecclesiastes does not defile the hands. And there's a dispute regarding the Song of Songs. So Rabbi Meyer lived about 130, excuse me, 139 to 163 AD. Rabbi Josie, uh, also second century, second Christian century, says, 
The song of songs defiles the hands, and there is a dispute regarding Ecclesiastes. Rabbi Shimon says Ecclesiastes is the lenient rulings of the house of Shammai and the strict rulings of the house of Hallel, but Ruth and the Song of Songs and Esther defile the hands. And that's a reference back to Mishnah Yadim 3.5. It is in line with what Rabbi Joshua said. It is taught. Rabbi Shimon ben Manasseh, who wrote it near the end of the second Christian century, beginning of the third Christian century, says, Ecclesiastes does not defile the hands because it is the wisdom of Solomon. And we saw that in Tosef the Yadim. He said to him, is that all he said? It is already said, quote, and he spoke 3,000 Proverbs, 1 Kings 5.12, and he says, do not add to his words, Proverbs 36. What is the meaning? And it says, and if you say, he said many things, what he wanted written was written, and what he wanted not written was not written. Come in here. Do not add to his words means that these and no others were written with divine inspiration. So that, I think, kind of fills out a little bit more of what's going on in the Tosepta, which was a little bit cryptic. And basically, it is a rebuke of Rabbi Shimon, who uh, believed that Ecclesiastes was not sacred, it was just mere human wisdom of Solomon. And the reply is that Solomon wrote a lot, but the ones that are consigned to writing are consigned to writing. So therefore, Ecclesiastes is sacred. Moving on, it says, it is taught on Tenanite authority, Rabbi Eliezer says Esther was said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as it is said, and Haman thought to himself, Esther 6.6. 6. Rabbi Kiba said Esther said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as it is said, and Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her, Esther 2.15. Rabbi Meyer said Esther was said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as it is said, and the thing became known to Mordecai, Esther 2.22. Rabbi Jose, son of the Damascene woman, says, Esther was said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as it says, and they did not take any of the spoils, Esther 9.15. Said Samuel, if I had been there, I would have said something better than all of them. As is said, they established and they accepted, Esther 9.27, meaning they established above what they accepted below. So once again, I think this is a, just a greater, more detailed explanation of what we found in the previous documents that go all the way back to the Mishnah, the earliest record of rabbinic oral tradition. And it focuses on specifically three books, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Esther. However, other books were disputed. We saw Ruth mentioned there, also Ezekiel and Proverbs. However, those, I think, do not have as much attention given, so they seem to be more minor disputes. But the major disputes centered around those three books, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Esther. Three books, by the way, that are never explicitly quoted in the New Testament either. And if you've followed our series when we're looking at various lists in antiquity, we noted that whenever Christians try to reproduce the sacred text used and accepted by the rabbis, many times the book of Esther is missing. And it's either listed as the last book. So these three books seem to be fringe books. They're on the blurry margins of what was considered inspired. And as you can tell by the dates from the rabbis, all of them center roughly around the second Christian century going into the third Christian century. That's these texts and other texts that have led many scholars, Protestant scholars, like Lee McDonald and others, to say that obviously there couldn't have been a closed, fixed rabbinic canon prior to the time of Christ or even immediately after the time of Christ. Otherwise, how do you explain these 
continuing disputes over the sacredness and inspiration of these books. Now, various explanations have been given, but quite frankly, none of them, I think, are very satisfactory. So I think we'll just start by here because we've gone over a lot of material and perhaps many of you may not be familiar about the ongoing disputes uh, within rabbinic Judaism. In fact, it seems that we don't have a universally accepted collection of sacred texts in rabbinic Judaism until much later. The first list appears also in the second century. The disputes continue, and it, it takes a couple of centuries, probably around the fourth Christian century, before you start finding a major consensus. I also want to take a second to dispel misunderstanding that's frequently thrown out there, namely that somehow or other we're suggesting that the Jews of Jesus' day or even in the second century, they didn't know which books were sacred, which books were in scripture. So when Jesus referred to the scriptures, they would have been dumbfounded because they didn't know what was in the scriptures. And this, quite frankly, is just a... uh, a straw man fallacy. The evidence shows, and I think this certainly fits in perfectly with this, is that coming out of the first century, the first Christian century, the Jews held to a core in which pretty much all the Jews, except for some parties like the Sadducees or Samaritans, although they're not really considered Jews, um, accept it. Okay. But the margins of this collection. Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Esther, maybe even a couple of other books, were still hotly debated as to whether or not they are sacred, whether or not they ritually defile the hands. And so, yeah, there is a core collection, but the edges, the ending of that collection, at least in rabbinic Judaism's literature, appears to be blurry. And maybe when we come back at the next video, We'll focus more in on the um, the Deuteral canon and other issues regarding the defiling of the hands. So again, if you enjoy this channel, please subscribe, like, hit the bell. Um, if you want to support William and I, we're on Patreon. We appreciate it. And until next time, God bless everybody. Bye.